hello party people and welcome to office hours uh the first live office hours in a home studio in a while and i'm back in san diego back in san diego uh, uh as opposed to down in cabo san lucas coming up here to run a few errands get a few uh things done and i thought oh why not take advantage of the home studio and do uh one of these live so let's rip through your sql server questions and see what we've got here so the first question comes from WTF SQL Server. Oh, let me set up this real quick so I can go show these up on the screen. I didn't even think about that. No beach views today, sadly, drop table employees. So the first one comes in from WTF SQL Server. This says, I have some, oh, howdy, D. Sanchez, good to see you. It says, I have some databases that take nearly six hours to uh, recover after patching to finish recovery. I've checked VLF counts and they're reasonable. The databases are in simple recovery. The logs are showing huge recovery times, but millisecond times for analysis. I would honestly call Microsoft for support. If you're having a production issue, because let's be frank here, if you're having a production issue where your SQL Server takes six hours to bring the databases online, why are you asking strangers questions on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook? Go just go open a support case. It's not like your management's going to be happy that it's taking that long. Go ask. That's that's just crazy. Um, I, I think that a lot of people are for some reason scared to call Microsoft for support. It's around 500 bucks US and they work the problem with you until it's done. And I'm not saying that you couldn't get answers for free somewhere, but you must have put this in a while ago. And you, last time your SQL Server rebooted, if it took six hours to come back, holy mackerel, your management cannot be happy. Don't don't screw around asking questions on forums. Go go open a case for Microsoft with, for five hundred bucks. Next up, Marcus asks: Is SQL Server the only relational database that can have perform parameter sniffing issues? So I don't know because I only work with MySQL, Postgres, and SQL Server. And out of those three, SQL Server is the only one that does. There could be others. I just wouldn't know. It's an interesting question, though. Ah, oh, Renegade Larson, good to see you uh, there. Saw Renee down in uh, London and had dinner. Good to see you, sir. Uh, I'm totally looking forward to one of the things I came back to the United States for was to eat at one of my favorite restaurants in the world, A by Jose Andres, going up there uh, next weekend, this coming this coming weekend, uh, to go do one of their tasting menus. Just absolutely love the place, and I've, whew, God, it shows Next up, we have Grumpy DBA's friend who says, a friend's manager wants him to replace a SQL Server 2012 Enterprise Server with a 2019 Standard Server with half the cores. It's a heavily used box with 40 databases running multiple critical applications. Should he just find a new job now? If he's not qualified to do it, uh, yes. So the, the thing is, this is what your job is to go performance tune SQL Server. You've got to be able to cut your costs uh, long term. You've got to be able to cut costs by doing performance tuning. And it may be that your management manager is like, because I, 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 let me tell you a story of a, a person that I worked with once. A person that I went worked with once went to one conference after another, one training class after another. And his boss got sick and tired of him saying, you know, hey, look, I need more training to do my job. Finally, the manager said, look, here, we sent you to the last conference to do this task. Go do it. You said that you'd come back and you'd be able to performance to in SQL Server. Do it. And at that point, the person had to kind of put up or shut up. And that, I, it was good for them for their career because it forced them to actually do something that they had been afraid to do for a really long time. You're probably thinking that it's the punchline is that it was me. No, it was not me. But uh, it was a friend of mine who ran into that problem. Legitimately a, a friend of mine. Uh, SQL sucks is hello, Brent. Howdy. Next up, we have Fairhot, and I, so I should say on that last one, yeah, I do that kind of work all the time. I cut costs for companies. It's totally doable. If you're running 100% CPU usage and you have been for a while, it's probably good that management kind of grabs you by the shoulders and makes you start doing something about that. Uh, Fairhot says, I use Ola Holmgren's maintenance script every night, but I found out that my SQL server goes unresponsive while the script executes. How can I both execute the script and make it responsive? The first uh, thing that I would ask is, you probably don't need to run index maintenance every night. 
if you use Ola Hollingren scripts with the defaults, they rebuild indexes really aggressively. Like even if you hit just 30% fragmentation, it starts doing index rebuilds. Most people don't need index rebuilds when they just hit 30% fragmentation. It's just not that big of a deal. Um, plus, they may have servers that constantly fragment specific tables over and over again, and there's no way to fix that. So the first thing that I'd ask is, why do we need to do it every night? And can we maybe do it every week instead, like do it on the weekends? The second thing that I would do, howdy, uh, good to hear from you. Uh, uh, the second thing that I would do is change the defaults. If you search for Brent Ozar, Ola Hollingren defaults, I've got a blog post out there with the defaults that I use for Ola Hollingren's maintenance scripts, and I dial the defaults way back. I think it's just overly aggressive. Um, and in that post, I give you examples of how to uh, make it happen more easily. Next up, Roland says, is it ever a good thing to create one of Clippy's suggested indexes when the query already runs sub second, but con consumes 200,000 logical reads? But let me uh, zoom out and ask a bigger question. When should I stop performance tuning a query? The first thing I'd ask is, are users happy with it, with the performance? The second thing I'd ask is, what are the top 10 most resource intensive queries on that SQL server? That's what you want to focus on. What are the top 10 most resource intensive queries on that SQL server? And I teach you how to do that in my fundamentals classes. Figure out what those are based on your server's top weight types, for example. The reason why I say that is you could have a query that's running thousands of times per second, and each time it runs, sure, it runs sub-second and does 200,000 logical reads, but the problem is that your SQL Server is getting death by a thousand cuts. So that's why you want to stay focused on what are the top 10 most resource-consuming queries so you can be working on those. Next up, Miguel asks, Hi Brent, what are the top issues that you see surrounding Microsoft's distributed transaction coordinator? People using it? <laughs> Surly Deb, good to see you. Hola, hello. <laughs> Uh, the problem with distributed transaction coordinator is I immediately get concerned that people are trying to do cross-server transactions. If you want latency, that's how you get latency. Go, go, hold on a second, I'm going to start a transaction. Let me phone a friend over in Brazil, and then we're going to phone another friend over in Tijuana. If you want to go fast in terms of transactions, don't coordinate uh, things to happen in multiple cities with your friends. The more that you coordinate, uh, the worse that performance is going to get. Howdy, Spitfire. Been a while since both you and uh, Surly Dev. We got the United Kingdom contingent in the house today. It's probably kind of late in the United Kingdom, I would think. It's probably like 9 or 10 p.m. Y'all should be in bed if you're old like me. <laughs> um, oh, SQL sucks. Uh, uh, up on the top there, you can ask your questions up there. Just because I want to be fair to folks who have add, put theirs in and, and uh, added things in there. Feel free to ask that, you know, put that in in the in the questions list and I'll get to it uh, in the questions. Next up, Oscar asks, Hi Brent, is Grumpy a justified stereotype for DBAs? Which is funny because somebody else just used the word grumpy inside their nickname. I would say absolutely yes. Ah, you're, that's true, you're not old. I think you're, you're older than I am, Renee. I think grumpy is totally justified because uh, I know a lot of DBAs who get burned out by the DBA jokes is that uh, it stands for don't, uh, don't uh, default blame acceptor that we end up getting expect, uh, hit with the blame for all kinds of different issues. People will say that the application is slow and it must be a database problem or and we're the most expensive thing in the house usually too, not just the database administrators. <laughs> it's true. Greg says, Greg says you're always grumpy on these streams. That was one of the things that I was going to get to, too, is it like what me personally, why the reasons why I get grumpy are uh, people don't read the manual. People don't read the manual. People build entire applications without reading the manuals for the tools that they're using. And then they're stunned when it doesn't perform well or it doesn't work the way that they want it to. 
it's just incredible how often people do this. And then they blame the product that they go, well, that sounds like a SQL Server problem. And I'm like, dude, it's a you problem. You're the meat bag who can't read the instructions, you know, and it just happens continuously. You see it all the time with the questions inside here. A lot of questions come in where I'm like, you could solve this in 30 seconds by reading the manual and just people don't do it. Um, I think another reason that people, uh, that the people in the database administrator role become grumpy is we're seen to do our job uh, when there's no complaints. When there are no complaints, people go, oh, you're doing your job, but then why are we paying you? Because everything's working and there are no complaints. Oh, hey, howdy, uh, uh, G Don Frio. I can never remember if you're, I, know, I can't remember if you're in Netherlands or where you're at. You're not G-Surgeon. That's another person over here. But I can never remember uh, where you're at. And did I see you at Bits? I can't remember if I did or not, Gabriel. I, there was somebody else named Gabriel at Bits. I don't remember if I ran into you or not. Uh, next up, we have Lewis. Lewis asks, uh, Italy, that's what it was, all right. Um, uh, Lewis asks, to combat the effects of parameter sniffing, should I proactively run a query once to put its first plan into cache? You would, oh, I did see you at bits. Okay, cool. All right, I thought so. I, I couldn't quite remember if it was you or not, but yeah, uh, very cool. It's always, it's always nice for these, like I met Renegade Larson, you know, I meet, I meet these people in person, Surly Dev, I met at SQL Bits, so it's always nice to actually be able to put a, a name to the face. I should do more selfies, I was real conscious of that. I didn't want to get too close to people and like do selfies all the time, but I wanted to do that just like to the people I knew from Twitch or Twitter or whatever, just so I could be like, aha, I, I remember you. Uh, but so, Lewis, the problem with this is the, the queries fall out of the cache. Queries fall out of the cache all the time. So for that strategy to work, you would also have to know when a query is going to fall out of cache and then immediately afterwards run it again. So it's not really practical. Next up, Hoss Cartwright asks, how can you detect when developers are hinting max stop zero in their queries? Well, if someone has max stop in their query, you can see it by looking for max stop in their query. Should have poured alcohol before I started this. Uh, so you can uh, search the text of that query of queries that people run. There are DMVs. There are even tools like SP Blitz Cache in the first responder kit. SP Blitz Cache has a parameter that you can use called slowly search plans for, where you can put in text that you're looking for inside queries for things like max stop. Uh, and a little bit of a sales pitch there. Uh, but so that's totally doable if you want to do that. SP Blitz Cache, look for the slowly search plans for parameter. But the other thing I would just do is look at your top 10 most resource intensive queries. Focus on those. Uh, people are doing bad habits everywhere all throughout their code. Focus on your biggest ones. I know people will learn one lesson and they'll go around like, you know, you teach them how to use a hammer and then they're banging the hammer on everything like, oh, this, now that I know how to use this, I'm going to use it on everything. And I'm like, no, instead of getting distracted by every bad habit, go look at your top 10 most resource intensive queries. If they're using max stop zero inside those queries, then you try it with different hints and you show them why that might be a bad idea. Are there any good ways to restrict max stop zero query hinting? Yeah, code reviews. You can do code reviews before code goes live. That's that's uh, good as well. Uh, next up, we have Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill says, I sometimes see articles where the author has the data file and transaction log file on separate drives. Is this big hammer recommended for performance reasons? What I would do when someone tells you to do something is ask them why. Ask them, what's the problem? that you're trying to solve? And how do I know if I'm having that problem? I've seen people say basically the same kind of thing in blog posts where, well, let me translate it into what they're really saying. You should always write T-SQL with your left hand. Because if you write T-SQL with your left hand, you'll never have performance problems. What in the hell? Where do people even get these ideas? Now, there are edge cases where it does make sense to separate your data and log files for performance reasons. 
if you have a boat anchor storage device and you need to break up queuing across multiple VMware VMDKs or something like that, but it's only a hammer that you want to use under specific issues. And if you can't explain how to know when you're having that problem, I get real sketch nervous that somebody's just like, always type T-SQL with your left hand. You know, it's a, one of those weird witch's tales that doesn't really make any sense. Next up, Sultan asks, what are the top gotchas and hurdles for a long time? <laughs> I probably wonder what that was. Long time pessimistic locking SQL developer moving to a whole new world of RCSI queries in uh, Azure SQL DB. Oh, I wish I could condense that down short. Uh, but unfortunately, that's why I have like a 60 minute module on it in mastering server tuning. Um, if you want like a, a uh, just a checklist for the developer portions, go to brentozar.com slash go slash RCSI brentozar.com slash go slash rcsi and kendra little's written a post on there about uh, the some of the things that developers need to consider when they're moving to rcsi or snapshot isolation but i would just caution that there are also performance issues that you got to watch out for as well next up turner burn says hi brent my friend is pulling his hair out over a deadlock issues. SP blitz lock shows lots of deadlocks between two queries, but both are query fast, crazy fast when executed. So poor performance does not seem to be an issue. How should he approach this to solve? You know, it's really tough as a presenter when uh, I have to walk the line between giving everything away for free versus charging for some stuff because I got to make a living, right? It's always tricky to figure out how to draw that line. And I feel really guilty every time we have a webcast and I say, you should go to this module of my training. Because after all, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm continuously doing sales pitches, but I have an hour long module in mastering query tuning covering that exact thing man this is tough i wish that i could debug it down to like a, a 30 second answer that i could do without code demos or a two minute answer that i could do with code demos and i just can't do it like the shortest that i can cram it in is the 30 to 60 minutes that it takes during that training class so i feel guilty saying this but I solve that exact problem in mastering query tuning in the deadlocks module. So if I could tell it to you a faster way, I totally would. But that's one of the reasons that I teach training classes. Uh, next up, Edgemon says, Hi Brent, does query store work well with cross database queries? What I would do now, see here, I'm going to give you a sales pitch for somebody else's course is go to Aaron Stilato's uh, training course on query store in Pluralsight. If you go to Pluralsight.com, maybe your company has a free subscription or you can get a trial or something. But Aaron Stilato's course inside there. The reason why is if you're asking something that elementary on Query Store, I bet you don't know things like which trace flags you should use, how you should configure capture and things like that. So definitely, I always tell people, go watch Aaron's course before you turn on Query Store because it is one of the features in SQL Server that can bring SQL servers down and it has so just be careful there go watch her course understand how to use it and it'll answer that question plus many others i don't teach a train a query store class because aaron was a consultant for a really long time and kept that course up to date she works for microsoft now but the course is still fresh she just recently moved to microsoft Next up, G Surgeon of the Netherlands asks uh, a database server. Howdy, David. Good to see you. Uh, a database server of a customer has eight processors and they're using standard edition. So four cores aren't being used due to licensing issues. OK, so you're misunderstanding something. It's a little tricky how this is set up. They set up their VM incorrectly. Have them change their VM to be one socket and eight cores or two sockets, four cores each. 
whether this is VMware or Hyper-V, it's going to be most likely one of those two, VMware or Hyper-V. Just tell that exact thing to their systems administrators, shut down the SQL Server, reconfigure it to be either two quad-core CPUs or one eight-core CPU. It's not going to cost anything. It's not going to do anything extra in terms of licensing. It'll just reallocate the way the VM is configured, and voila, immediately all eight cores will be available. He says, it's wasteful, but can it lead to other problems? Yes. Uh, and that link that you said in SP Blitz, that link in SP Blitz, if you read the more details, gives you the problems like memory being offline, excessive latch EX weights. Uh, there's another poison weight that I forget which one it's called uh, that pops up all the time for when half of your cores are offline. So definitely check that out. But it's really easy. It's your, your, sys, your customer sysadmins will be able to do that lickety split. Next up, Sir Logalot. <laughs> I mean, they exactly meet the grumpy VMware guy. And you can tell them it's not a VMware problem either. You can be like, look, I know this isn't a VMware problem. It's not for once. It's not going to be used. I won't blame it on you. You'll be the solution instead of the problem. He was actually the problem because he set it up incorrectly, but we're going to let that fly. Uh, Sir Logalot says, will you ever consider writing a SQL anti-patterns book? No. Because books don't pay anything. Oh. Books are a vanity project these days. Where if you want to get your name, and there's nothing wrong with a vanity project. I say I'm, I'm the guy with a you know domain name and I'm streaming on Twitch answering SQL Server questions. Um, books are more of a vanity project that you want to see your name on the cover of something. And it can open doors when you've never had a book before. You can be like, yeah, I'm the guy who wrote the book on, you know, service broker or whatever, uh, especially in the day and age now where there's no competition for a lot of books. If you want to write a book on SQL anti-patterns, you'd probably be the only author that's out there right now. Um, but the problem is it's a hilarious amount of work. It's thousands of hours worth of work. And you could take that same thousand hours worth of time and you could do things like stream on Twitch for free. How does that work again? Oh, I make ad money. Okay, so that actually works out okay. Uh, next up, Suleiman asks, Hi Brant, what are the top features of Postgres and Oracle that you would love to see incorporated in a future version of SQL Server? Go to feedback.azure.com. Feedback.azure.com is where you can see the most highly voted features, some of which are coming from Postgres users, some of which are coming from Oracle users, some of which are coming from me. I have put my own things inside there. That's absolutely true, too, given the fly. Uh, I put my own features inside there, and then you can see the number of hundreds or thousands of upvotes and see that Microsoft just completely ignores them and closes them as won't fix. And then, like me, You'll stop asking. What did I say about being grumpy? But no, seriously, like I've given up on asking Microsoft for stuff because there's people inside Microsoft that seem to be doing totally their own thing. Like Java stored procedures? Who thought that was a good idea? SQL Server 2019, people get them trotting out on stage. Now you can run Java inside a SQL Server. Hello? 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 I'm like, do, do, do you know anyone who thinks that on Windows, Java has a good answer for performance? Hey, you know what we, we want to do? We want to go really fast. You know what we should install? Java, said no one ever. So I, I get that they're trying to compete with Oracle, and that's how they're trying to do it, is to nibble off every feature that Oracle has. I mean, look at anybody who uses that stuff, and you're like, well, why would you do that? That's, that's just insane. If you need Java... Go running at Oracle. That's that's what they do. Next up, we have Frankie G. Frankie G says, in a recent server survey, I found the option to use legacy cardinality was on. I inquired and I told that it was due to having a market drop in performance. Then it was the only option to fix the problem. Could you explain why this may be? Yeah, totally. So legacy cardinality. Uh, up until SQL Server 2014, basically, whenever you ran a query, SQL Server would always guess that the same number of rows would come back based on your filters. I'm looking for all the customers named uh, Alicia who live in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Well, SQL Server always used the same algorithms for decade plus, and then all of a sudden in SQL Server 2014, they introduced a new cardinality estimator. And it wasn't necessarily better. It was for some queries. It was worse for other queries. So people all the time had uh, performance backfiring issues. The most common way to solve it was to set your compatibility level back to an older version. And a less common way to fix it was to play around with legacy cardinality. And it's fine. You're not missing anything. You don't want to be the, the person who says, I'm going to go put in the new version, waboom, and then all of a sudden some things get better and some things get way worse. You're blamed for the ones that got worse. So make sure you're solving a problem that people actually have there. Uh, ooh, next up, 1440 by 1080, which is an excellent resolution, I'm sure, in olden days. It says, is there a way to recreate query text based on its execution plan? No, because it can get clipped off. Oh, howdy, bots. Go, good to see you again. Uh, no, it can get clipped off, unfortunately. The execution plan will trim off uh, once the query becomes too large. Another thing that can happen is the query may be, for example, calling a view. And the view might have all kinds of different T-SQL in it than what shows up in the execution plan. So nope, unfortunately, that's just not uh, simply not an option. Next up, SQL Padawan asks a career related question. In your experience, what has helped you to decide when it's time to move on to another place or to your own thing? By the time you ask yourself the question, it's time. That sucks to hear, doesn't it? But when you ask yourself, should I move on or not? It is time. It may not be the right time for you financially. You may have commitments to your family for health insurance, the location that you're in. But when you find yourself asking that question, it's time to ask, could I afford to leave now? If another job gave me X amount of money, would I be able to financially leave and still take care of my loved ones and deal with health insurance? If that answer is yes, then you get a resume out, you talk to recruiters. The time to look isn't when you're fired or laid off. The time to look is when you have a comfortable job. You just don't like it that much anymore. I, I know that some people will say you should talk to your manager about, you know, feeling frustrated or burned out or whatever, but that starts a ticking time bomb where your manager may not ever trust you again and will probably pass you up for things, might give you a temporary promotion or whatever, but it's a, it's a time bomb thing that they'll give you more money just to keep you around for short periods of time. But the things that made you unhappy are still going to make you unhappy, even if you're temporarily paid 5%, 10% more, go start looking. Next up, uh, Jason Stapley says, is the future of database administrator role data engineer, or data lead, or data steward, or other? I'm seeing a trend toward data engineer. Nice seeing you. Oh, nice seeing you too as well. Uh, it's rare that people move from DBA to data engineer. Data engineer tends to be more of a, how am I going to get the data ready and prep it for the machine learning type folks, for the, uh, the data analysts, for the data scientists. That may not be an upward career strategy. Um, oh, you're welcome, Chris. That's uh, sad to hear that, but yeah, I know exactly what you mean. You know, when you realize that that's the, even when it's, when you're willing to admit it to yourself, that's when it's time to, to move on. Um, I, I think for data engineer, I think it's more of a, an entry level thing for developers who came out of college with Python, R, uh, uh, Java, C sharp, whatever, that can move data around from one place to another. Um, there are awesome data engineer jobs. There are awesome data reliability engineering jobs. These days, the, the whole data thing, uh, job titles, uh, titles are getting kind of thrown up in the air and shuffled around sideways. I've even got customers who've said, 
data science is sexy to us right now, so we're hiring people and calling them data engineers, but what they really are is database administrators. We just couldn't hire enough database administrators. The company couldn't give us enough money for that. So we're taking this budget from the data science team and we're calling them data engineers, but in reality, they're managing queries, tuning, backups, etc. So. Oh, geez, behind the CBA is behind the scenes. DBA asks when you manage more DBAs under you. I don't. I never have. I mean, other than than being in consulting and as I sucked as a manager then. So um, how do you keep the synergy and interactions amongst the DBAs as healthy as possible? Sometimes I see some members act like they're better than the others. That's not really a database problem as much as it is a general staffing problem. Management is really an art that's very different from uh, the science of technology. Uh, and not a, and technology can totally be a science or can totally be an art too. Uh, but human resources, management, talent management, project management, all those things are totally different than pushing keys and getting a reliable thing to happen, you know, fire through a computer. So what I would say is, if you want to be a DBA manager, go take management training courses because it is totally different. And managing the good team on an ongoing basis. I was really good at hiring a good team. Like I could pick people out really easily. I can't manage worth a damn. Now, um, SQL sucks as I'm dealing with the same issues at my job. I'm not sure which ones they are because we're discussing so many issues now, which is uh, kind of funny. Uh, next up, we have Ned asks, other than do it, yeah, yes, you, absolutely, I totally agree. Uh, other than do it out of hours and use no lock, how would you suggest my friend query a couple of error log tables, 5 million rows, uh, for messages? The column is text. He would like to confirm beforehand that he won't be using too many resources. Go do it in a development box, go restore the database somewhere else, and go query it over there. Um, that's the, the simple, easy way. Then you can see how your query works. And if it doesn't need to be mission critical and up to date, that's a great way to offload uh, work. Oh, management issues. Yeah. I, and it's so hard. It's really the, the pandemic exposed so many management problems. A friend of mine and I were talking about this at bits that, uh, that the, the pandemic really separated the great managers from the people who were just barely hanging on. I know when I was a manager, I was just like barely hanging on. If I would have had to take care of the mental health of my team, you know, if I had 10 database administrators underneath me, if I had to take care of their mental health, make sure that they were still uh, on track to succeed personally, make sure that the company's goals were getting done, make sure that the rest of the company was okay with my team being remote, dealing with the stress of trying to get my team to be remote forever. Uh, that those are really hard problems. And I, I don't envy managers at all. It's really challenging. Uh, next up, let's see here. Management uh, GI Joe DBA says management wants their first data warehouse in Azure. Data will be sourced from a few hundred gigabyte databases. Uh, somebody name drops CDC. Is it worth a look or is SSIS? So the thing, yeah, start with a spec, step way back and go, we're going to develop a data warehouse. How are we going to have a standard way of moving data between sources? And then the nice thing is, is you don't have to have any internal company knowledge to build that thing. When we're talking about moving data, and I'm purely talking about the moving data part, not the part about how you sketch out relationships between tables, business entities, what does sales tax mean, and all that kind of thing. That requires business knowledge. But moving the data from one place to another does not require business knowledge. So that's where you hire in someone who does ETL for a living and say, we need a framework that's going to be repeatable and extensible, that will be easy to manage to see when things go wrong, that will easy, be easy to restart, that will have good logging. CDC is a tool just as SSIS or Azure Data Factory is a tool. It is not a solution. It's a tool that you use to build a solution. And if you haven't built one of those solutions before, go hire somebody who does. I don't say that in a condescending way, like, you don't know what you're doing. 
I don't know how to do that. Like, I know that there are people who do it. And every now and then I sit in on SSIS or Azure Data Factory sessions at conferences, just as AWS glue and so forth, just to see what the current state of the art looks like. And I'm always amazed at like the people who do that. There's a real art to that. And I do not have that art. I wouldn't want to learn it from scratch unless you want to make your career out of it. Uh, I'll talk about Bruno. I still haven't seen that uh, that uh, Disney thing. Um, it says, what is your favorite deprecated feature in SQL Server? Oh, wow. Uh, ending queries with a semicolon. So technically, ending semi if you don't end your queries with a semicolon, yes. Oh, Michael J. Sword, good to see you. Um, uh, if you don't end your queries in a semicolon, technically that's deprecated. I laugh so hard when I heard that because I'm like, Microsoft, look, seriously, you get paid when people continue to migrate to newer and newer versions of SQL Server. You get paid when people upgrade and pay software assurance. Why in the heck would you think that all the applications out there in the world are suddenly going to magically have semicolons at the end of every statement? If a new version of SQL Server came out that broke, if you didn't have semicolons at the end, people just wouldn't buy it. They just wouldn't move to it. That would be the last death knell for SQL Server. That would be the end right there. So I laughed when they tried to do that. I'm like, okay, sure. Let's see you actually implement that. Hmm. If you asked me earlier, I, I probably would have said Profiler, you know, back uh, 10 years ago, maybe, because um, I used to like Profiler a lot. I haven't used Profiler in probably a decade now uh, because I really like the, uh, Eric Darling's SP Human Events makes uh, uh, pro extended events real easy to use and query, and I don't have to know any XML syntax. It just works. It's beautiful. It's utterly fantastic. So I, I haven't used uh, Profiler in forever, uh, partially because of that. Next up, SQL Sucks asks, Hello, Brent. How was your SQL Bits experience in London, and what did you enjoy the most? I love SQL Bits. It's a super friendly conference. It's very laid back. The uh, organizers do a heroic job of making sure that everybody's taken care of. They really think about the attendee experience and the speaker experience. Great example today, uh, uh, Catherine Wilhelmson, which is a, a really good speaker in the BI uh, space, uh, posted a blog post about how she had, uh, she was subject to a harassment incident at uh, SQL Bits, and that SQL Bits had a whole plan laid out. They were prepared and they they aggressively went after it and made sure that she, as well as they could, as much as she was, she could be taken care of. And I remember when SQL Bits laid out that their code of conduct a couple of years ago and then their harassment policies this year, I was like, that's really taking attendee experience seriously. Um, and that that that's the kind of thing that people really remember for a long time. Um, as a pre-con speaker, I speak at workshops. I do uh, training day workshops as the event gets started. They are so, I totally agree, they are so attentive. Uh, uh, they always have runners there all around the place that if you need anything. This year, I needed cough lozenges. I forgot to bring throat lozenges, and I was having asthma issues. And I said, hey, to my the person who was in my show, I, or my, uh, my runner, my person who was managing my room, I said, hey, could you, I know this is a long shot. I said, but if anybody has throat lozenges, that'd be amazing. They sent somebody to the pharmacy got me two kinds of throat lozenges and two kinds of cough syrup. I was like, dang, okay, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. They're, they're seriously attentive. Uh, it was a great experience. I just loved it overall. Um, the part I enjoyed the most, it's always interesting seeing people in costumes, or the British call it fancy dress, uh, at a party. Um, and really, but for me, and th so that's normally the thing that would be the biggest, uh, most attractive thing for me, the uh, thing that I get the most excited about. Um, and it, it was so good. I think for me this time, it was seeing people again. Uh, I got really emotional when I saw, when I walked into the, the venue and I started seeing people that I knew again, you know, speakers, 
vendors, attendees, where I was like, I've met you before, you know, I really want to hug you, I still can't do that yet, you know, I have asthma and all. Um, but that was that was really wonderful seeing people again for the first time. And then we had like two days into it, uh, second day of the conference, one of the speakers tested positive for COVID. Uh, and it was a person that I would have hugged in a heartbeat had I seen him. I've just known the guy for years and decades, I guess. And I would have immediately run to him and hugged him. And, and he's totally a hugger too. I'm a hugger. I'm, you know, now these days I, I try much less to be. Um, and when he emailed out, you know, or tweeted out, I tested positive and I was like, oh, God, yeah, no. Uh, so I tried to be pretty good about keeping my mask on through the rest of the conference. Bits even had uh, a COVID test uh, at the door that you could get for speakers, attendees, whatever. And they encouraged us, you know, test once, twice a day uh, to make sure that everybody's safe and taken care of. So that was just wonderful. It's really well done. Next up, D-Man asks, uh, say one node of your two node cluster is suddenly dead, a non-recoverable hardware failure, and you have a 24 hour old VM snapshot for that server. What is your suggestion to recover the cluster with that VM snapshot? Uh, okay, there are a couple things that are confusing inside here. One, you said a VM snapshot. Two, you said it's a non-recoverable hardware issue. If it's a VM, you should be able to immediately start it on another piece of hardware. Virtual machines should always, always, always be backed by centralized storage so that if you lose one server, you can simply fire up that same VM on another server. If you had non-recoverable hardware issues that were so bad that they trashed the disk, I get real nervous about ever using that storage again not the physical storage it might be fine but the bits on disk that you saved as good nope that's not what a cluster's for there's a saying in the cloud treat your servers like cattle not like pets meaning you're okay if one of your cows dies. It's just the natural course of life. You have a whole herd of cows, a herd of cattle, whatever they're called. Look, I'm from the city. I don't really appreciate, know how this stuff works. Cow patties smell bad. I don't do tipping cows. I None of that stuff. Um, they're really beautiful from afar, and they taste really good. Uh, but uh, anyway, where were we? So treat your servers like cattle, not like pets. I have always believed that with clusters. The reason you have a two node cluster is that you can put a bullet in one of them and completely walk away from it. Screw that image. You still have one working node, right? Just build a brand new Windows VM and join it into that same cluster. But put a bullet in that other one and kiss it goodbye. Next up, uh, I want to be on a beach in Cabo says, I have a legacy source system that used big ints for a primary key. We switch to a new system that uses Vercare as the new PK. It's still a big int. No joints. To, I feel dirtier and dirtier the more that I read this. No joints to the source systems. Should I convert the new? <laughs> okay, hold up. What's the problem you're trying to solve? I get so nervous about people changing data types on an existing system. That scares the bejesus out of me. When you say we switch to a new system, that makes it sound like this thing was already built, it was architected. It, don't go changing data types on an existing server just or on an existing database just to make yourself feel better or, or worry about joins in the future. I just simply step back and go, before we change anything, let's think out real carefully this time instead of just winging it like crazy. Put a lot of thought. Renegades has done that. Didn't go well. Me too. I've totally done that where I've, I've had people say, oh, this is going to be the last and final data type. And I go through a whole bunch of conversions and then they're like, oh, we need to make a change. And I'm like, because that's a big, ugly logged operation. I would I would think real hard about doing that. Uh, next up, Gabriel says, my friend's development team is developing the old apps in .NET Core with code first. It's always the last. <laughs> um, that means that the database structure is binded by the program. Yep, my friend can't suggest query changes because the queries are made by .NET. I see my friend's future dark. 
The idea behind Code First and Entity Framework is that you're going to be able to ship code, and I, I got to pronounce that carefully, ship with a P, ship code really quickly and ship applications really quickly so that you can get paid quickly. It is technical debt. You know, you're, you're building not necessarily the best quality code, not necessarily the best quality database. Code First has some hilariously laughable defaults. Like I've seen, at least in the last version that I looked at, any new string was an Enver Care Max by default. And I was like, oh God, come on, seriously. Um, so uh, it does ship stuff really quickly. A lot of applications never get that much use. Yeah, exactly the other kinds of ship. Um, a lot of uh, applications never get that much use or you just need a quick proof of concept. But the thing I would just know is if this pig needs to fly, then you're probably going to have to put a lot of work into it later down the road. Um, one thing I will point out, stackoverflow.com started as link to SQL. It wasn't even a good version of Link to SQL. It was the early versions of Link to SQL. Stack Overflow did okay. I mean, they ended up selling for like a billion dollars, you know, so they, they seem to do all right. Just make sure. Bots goes exactly right. In the future, as the database grows, you have a ticking time bomb where you're going to have to slide the technical debt credit card through again. You're going to have to suffer through a rewrite at some point. Is it going to be expensive? Yes. If the application grows. But it may never grow. It may have been a quick and dirty proof of concept. And of course, those are the ones that catch on the most and become most popular. So Logs A Lot says, nice fanboy shirt. Uh, where do you purchase your funny shirts? Mostly Instagram. I am a real sucker for Instagram ads and I get targeted with some really good stuff because they know the kind of things that I like to buy. I buy a lot of stuff through Instagram ads. It's really, really effective. There's also a lot of stuff I'd love to buy, but it's just too expensive. But uh, so this was an Ames Brothers shirt for Boeing when Boeing was trying to salvage their reputation from the whole uh, 737 Max, whatever it was. They started putting out interesting social media stuff. And like this is a turbo fan engine for those of you who aren't familiar with the look of it. Um, remove the backup for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then lastly, we have Bottega says, Hi, Brent, love your show from the beach. I kind of enjoy the beach shows as well. I see in the XML, the compiled query plan of a slow query, a parameter data type vercare 20 with a C followed by 19 white spaces. Is that bad or does the optimizer solve that kind of thing? That's totally okay. You don't have to worry about that at all. All right, well, that is the end of today's office hours. I will call it quits here and uh, go get myself. I have been up since 2 a.m. No, that's, I'm sorry, that's not true. 11 p.m. local time. So it is now coming up on 3 p.m. local time in San Diego. I got up at 11 p.m. last night in order to teach a class on Europe time. So I've been up for, I mean, it's not a heroic amount of time. 12 plus 3 is 15, 16, 16 hours, with is a lot of, ha, ha, ha. You can do that on, uh, like, what's the name of the t-shirt company? I forget the name of it, but if you sell Google for like custom t-shirt sales, there are a bunch of companies that do it. So thanks for hanging out with me today. And I will see y'all next uh, tomorrow, actually, on another live episode of Office Hours. Adios, y'all.